Well, good morning, people. It's Thursday morning of the English debate in the election campaign, and you are listening to Curse of Politics. Curse of Politics features Jenny Byrne, a former conservative operative, and Scott Reed, a former liberal operative, neither whom of which is involved in the campaign this time. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good, David. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm very well. Nice to see you. You sound slightly narcotic, David. Is everything all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, here to shake things up is Nick Taylor Vasey from Politico. Nick, what is the playbook saying this morning? Playbook's living the dream. Living the dream. Um, there's a bunch in there because there was a debate last night. It was it was in French. There were 5,000 moderators and uh, and and a lot of back and forth, a lot of crosstalk. The moderators, kind of was the, moderators, the moderators were the best part of the debate last night. They were the only interesting thing that happened. <laughs> I, I really, Strong really showcase disagree for journalists. That. You Strong agree or disagree, Scott? No, no, I really disagree with that. It was insane. It was like Lighthouse. There were 100,000 people on stage, <laughs> some playing horns. Helen <laughs> Bazzetti. Like where she would just, it's like she bribed the doorman. Suddenly she just have journalists who weren't even part of the show. They just walk on, start asking questions and aggressive. That's what I liked about it. They were actually fighting back and forth. And it I'm wasn't kidding. just like, they were like fighting. Well, you said this five years ago and you said this. And they're like. Alain Bazzetti, Alain Bazzetti puts a question to Aaron O'Toole. He says three words. She says, look, motherfucker, I asked you a question. Stand up straight. Like it was, Whoa. Anyway, hi, Nick. It's your segment. Sorry, we'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It was like a series of scrums, hey? It was like, come up to the to the mic and get yelled at for a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, and then there was the true star of the show, which was the 11-year-old Charles, who asked a question about <laughs> climate change and professed to be already thinking about having his own children, which is an insane thing for that child if he was really thinking that to be thinking because he's a boy. Yeah. But... Uh, I thought also the, the the way the leaders responded to that was a bit instructive because it felt like here was this kid and it was empathy them, across the board. That's what you're going to say, right, Nick? Is that they really got into that kid's head and they related to him on his level? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, they all they all spoke directly to the child and, and not just talk, not just talked about Paris. Paris commitments and, <laughs> but and, with, and carbon capture and, and you know, whatever is in their platform. But with clunky cross cultural uh, pop culture references, right? So like Aaron O'Toole is going, do they have French superheroes where you live, Shaw? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's weird. And then the, the other moment that, that I honestly remember, because uh, at this point, life is, is just a, a series of blurs uh, and I, I can barely recognize my face in the mirror, but um, when when Trudeau took on uh, Blanchette over being a Quebec, I'll never forget and, you, Nick. Thank you, thank you, David. Appreciate it. Uh, but you know, I mean, there's there's a real good shot that if there's one day a, a debate in British Columbia, if Justin Trudeau gets another shot at this, when there will be a a party leader who professes to be British Columbian, and Justin Trudeau will yell very passionately, "I'm a British Columbian. You don't have a monopoly on being <laughs> British Columbian." But he did that last night, and and I don't know if it was persuasive to people, but it's something I remembered, and that always counts, right? Yeah, I I figure that that thing was most effective among uh, Anglo liberals, and then declined in relevance from that point on. Myself, but I'm not <laughs> calling you a liberal, Nick. I'm just saying you're Anglo. <laughs> I just remember it. <laughs> You are an Anglo, Nick, so quit shooting. <laughs> I'm just a Blue Jays fan. Happy that they won again. Did they ever? Amazing. All right. What else you got? We got to carry on. Yeah, we've got, uh, obviously, a debate tonight, so everyone's in town. The only itinerary that came out had the kind of event that I think, Scott, you might love. Uh, it's uh, Jagmeet Singh and his wife going to Hintonburg, trendy little neighborhood, and going to a baby shop because they are expecting... And that's a photo op. And it's, what are you going to call it, not delightful? I dare you to be cynical about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I used to live in Hittenberg. I know that they're going to have a baby. I still think the best place to go is the uh, Carlton Tavern. That would be my advice. <laughs> that's good advice. <clears throat> All right, Nick. It was great to see you. Are you going on the road this week? You hinted you might be going on the road this week. Yeah, the itinerary is still coming together, but I will be out there. You will see 
a backdrop that will be some kind of comfort in or, but, but yeah, probably a comfort in somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> or, all right, brother. It was great to see yeah. you. Thanks for getting up. Okay. See you guys. See you, man. All right, David. All right. Give Jenny us the data. We are empirically minded. Jenny starts to pay attention to the show around this time. <laughs> Where are the leaders on debate day? Fuck. Come on. Moment. <laughs> give me the polls. Give me the polls. <laughs> well, Scott, I'm going to introduce the polling data today oh, by God. saying, you know who's been right about this election campaign all along? And like by that, I mean for like a year now. Who? Jenny Byrne. Oh, good. I love hearing that. Well, I, I'd like to ask you why you've come to this conclusion today. National three-day roll based on 1,300 cases. Frank is significantly up to sample on a nightly basis. So we're, we've got 1,300 this week only. So all the weekend data is all gone. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Conservatives, 34. They're holding. Liberals, 31. NDP, 16. Ooh. Green Party, 4. Bloc Québécois, four. People's Party, 11. Oh, ho, ho, ho. That's why you're right, Jenny. The People Party. People's Ontario. Party. 39 Liberal. 33 Conservative. 13 NDP. 3 Green. 11 People's Party. Wow. Wait for this. Wait wait for this. I'm not done. Quebec. 31 liberal. 21 conservative. 10 NDP. 6 green. 18 block. 13 people's party. Okay. That's Now I love Frank and I trust Frank. So I, but I will tell you, we have a polling had, dispute here about this. There's no question. We yes. have a polling dispute here. And I and heard from two or three Francophones. We need to yesterday. acknowledge that. Yeah. Well, we need, there's two things. There's a polling dispute about Quebec, obviously. So let's acknowledge that Leger came out yesterday with a, not a tracking poll, but uh, a sample, I presume, done over the weekend, um, in which they said that the block was at 27. Right. The only thing I'm going to say about the dispute about how strong the People's Party is, and um, most organizations are not showing them at this level. So, frankly, this is a you know this is a big uh, high stakes for Frank and, uh, in showing this number. But and Jenny uh, and Jenny, she's invested. She's right the same. She's right in the rowboat with Frank. Yeah, but my professional reputation isn't based on it. The, the, the argument that I think one would make at this point, and, and again, based largely on the U.S. experience, is are these the kind of people who sign up for a polling panel and agree to be surveyed on a regular basis, um, you know, and ask questions about whether they're male, female, or non-binary? And um, so I think that, frankly... The random digit dialing and the co the combination of the random digit dialing and the robot on the other end of the phone with no social stigma attached to it means Frank is likely to have a more accurate read on this than other people. Only time will tell. But my sense is that his methodology is more likely to find it than a panel is. Yeah, so these results are in some ways similar to what we ended the last election at in terms of like the Ontario numbers. The PPC is the only um, uh, is the only difference. And even if they are half of what Frank's saying they are, they're they're absolutely going to be a factor uh, in this election in Ontario and Quebec, probably more Quebec. I, I can only speak from what I what I hear. I was speaking to people yesterday. I spoke to, to one guy, a friend of mine who went door knocking in what is a target riding, something we have to pick up would have been a class of of 08 for us uh, in uh uh, back in the day. And uh, the first three doors he knocked on in one of our best polls, 
traditionally, the first three people he got home were all supporting the People's Party. So there's just more and more evidence that I, I, I see. It. And, and most, most places I talk to, if they're not tied in signs with the Conservative Party, uh, they actually have more signs than the Conservative Party has. And that's on private lawns as well. And so that's the, that's the only thing that sticks to me, that these numbers can be even half right. And and that is that that can be the difference between uh, what is going to be a liberal and a conservative uh, a conservative government, because if you look at these numbers from from Quebec and Ontario, uh, Trudeau is Trudeau could could end up with more seats if the, these numbers hold. Uh, he'll be he'll be delivered his 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 election in in uh, in the two biggest provinces. That's what it looks like. Well, and it's interesting because it, it assuming Frank's numbers are accurate, what it's telling you is that the People's Party is gutting the Bloc vote as well. Uh, the Blanchet is not having the kind of campaign he's had in the past, and that in addition to you know halting let's let's put it this way in addition to halting the potential for momentum in Quebec to the conservatives they're they're clearly cannibalizing some of the bloc uh vote in in francophone Quebec and so you know those you know they can think they're lucky stars O'Toole and Blanchette that uh Maxime Bernier wasn't on that stage last night because you know if they had added the 32nd person and it had been him he probably would have done some damage to them well so Scott I actually was talking to a good friend of mine who I trust uh implicitly um uh, on this stuff and we actually kind of came to the conclusion by the end of the conversation that maybe maybe we've been wrong in in this analysis maybe it's actually better that Bernier wasn't on the stage because One, the myth of him is better than the reality the myth is the myth is better than yeah. the man and so so um people <laughs> People, people, that's how so people often talk. true. That's, that's how people talk about David. Uh, <laughs> wow, I met him and I was really disappointed. <laughs> so, so, so it's better to be that's it's it's people kind of have a bit view as to why they're supporting the People's Party. There's obviously some people that don't like vaccine passports, don't like mandatory vaccines, but there's other reasons why people are voting. There, it's it's literally none of the above, and and so it it might be better. It's it, considering yeah, the format wasn't sense. really conducive to a real debate. There wasn't really much he could throw out uh, towards Aaron or towards Blanchette. Um, it might actually just be better for him that he wasn't part of it. And, and any of his anti-establishment type supporters, they're totally fine with him not being being invited. It's kind of like a badge of honor. Yeah, that makes sense. Although I do think that I care. I mean, when you've got that kind of protest, angry, I want to reject them all movement, when you can attach to it a charismatic and compelling face, and we've seen, you know, historically, then, then things can really take off. So, Having somebody who was on the stage last night saying, "Look, I'm giving you permission to feel this way and to, and to direct your vote," it could be compelling. But I, I buy the myth thing. I buy that. You know, it's better to be a movement uh, than an accountable individual politician. Maybe I, you know, that makes some sense. Well, and, and if you remember the debates last time, not the French ones. He was he was he was decent in the French ones in terms of comportment. But it's evident that he still has trouble following English. That's what it was like. Yeah. We everyone thought he was an ass in the English debate last time, but I don't think he was trying to be an ass. I just don't think he could follow the debate as closely as what, um, uh, th th that's why he interjected. That's why he talked louder. Um, so anyways, that's kind of where I've, I've now come around, um, uh, on, uh, on Bernier debates. One, one other last thing I'll see if you agree with me guys on this about these numbers is that uh, the NDP appear to be determined, uh, to believe in alchemy. Like they just, I, I was on TV last night. There was, uh, and you, Jenny, and you in the afternoon, you and I were on TV too with a, a person in the New Democrats. And they're just. Yeah, it was lonely. It was lonely watching the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> we felt like we were, we were kind of cheating on you. We were like, I wonder if David's yeah, at home. I felt that way here on this end too. <laughs> I was like, Jenny and I, I know were that like. Evan Solom I know that Evan Solomon's a shiny object, but Jesus. <laughs> we were like, we'll rush home, see if David's got dinner ready. Um, <laughs> But uh, it was just, you know, like listening to the New Democrats, they, they're like, you know, he's doing great. He's really appealing. People really are responding to him and they like him. And I keep looking at the numbers and saying, guys, it is not showing up in the win column. And I don't see any indication that they and in his performance, in his tactics, that they're going to vary from that. So they just assume that there will be a an orange wave last week, 2011 alchemy that will just have people suddenly go, all right, I've decided I'm going to channel my uh, my affection for him into my vote. And I, I, I don't see any evidence of that's happening. All right, let's continue our little talk about perception versus reality. This is number two in a series. Perception. 
curse of politics is three veteran politicos who are never without a deeply thoughtful, well-expressed opinion. Reality. We record this thing at 6.30 every morning. I set my alarm for five, push news, push news, then drink a gallon of coffee. Without that, I can't even form a complete sentence. The perception for most Canadians is that our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is a telco, albeit the friendliest telco with cute little critters, but TELUS is actually a technology company, one with a social purpose, born in Canada, living in Canada, and thriving globally by investing in digital technology that makes life better. Case in point, TELUS Agriculture. TELUS Agriculture is the largest agriculture technology business in the world. Their vision is to digitally connect all the players in what was historically the most siloed of industries. From seed to farm to fork and all the constituents in between, transportation, warehousing, wholesaling, retailing, and more. What you get is better collaboration, enriched data sharing, streamlined operations, and efficiencies. So that the way we grow and get our food is safer and more sustainable, economically, environmentally, and socially. Not a small task. TELUS Agriculture is in more than 50 countries and already works with nine of the 10 top agricultural customers in the world. It's telling. While their competition spends big money on sports teams and media properties, TELUS would rather focus on innovating and investing in technology in industries like agriculture, healthcare, and more. To do some good, go to TELUS.com to learn more. So if you want to look into this data a little bit, it appears, now a person would need to do a lot more analysis than this, but just looking at the cross tabs, it appears that the People's Party is eating the NDP's lunch among young people. Now, this is an interesting mm. phenomenon. So here's the under 35 number. 27 conservative. 22 liberal. 23 NDP, 5 Green, 21 People's Party. Hmm. Wow. Classic, classic. I mean, the People's Party, when you get over 50, they're less than 4% of the vote. It's all among people under the age of 50 and mostly people under the age of 35. Well, you know, I mean, the these are not the cranky. These are not cranky old white men. Get off my lawn. Those people are voting for one of the main establishment parties. Because well, those people think the institutions have worked for them. They think those institutions have protected their health and their cousin. And those people have experienced the implications of the pandemic. And I think these guys are like, you know, there's a that natural anti-establishment. I'm distrustful of politicians. Um, there's, you've been spoken to for months and months and months by politicians telling you what to do, where you can go lockdowns. You know, a lot of people are 26 are pretty pissed off with the fact that he had, you know, my 22 year old, right. Couldn't go to a bar and see his friends for months and months. He lived through his PlayStation. So, you know, like I can, I can understand how that chemistry comes together. Well, and another thing that will be interesting is the number of ridings, the, um, uh, the Green Party are running in. Uh, you saw yesterday Elizabeth May. She's really fucking helpful to Annemie Paul. She's just, you love having someone. Endorsed the liberal? Unreal. She endorsed the liber liberal in uh, Langley, Cloverdale City. And so um, that's a riding <laughs> where we won by a very small margin. That's Tamara Jensen of uh, of uh, Convergent Therapy video fame and uh, talking about uh, lesbian activity. Um, and so with no with no activity. Green Party candidate there, that I Pardon? Do tell. Oh, careful. <laughs> Fucking careful, David. Fucking careful. We may um, have to make an edit. <laughs> so, but there's other writings like that. You've got almost all the Scarboroughs. You've got all the Bramptons. You've got, tw I think, 20 writings in Quebec. So you've got the dynamic there that the, you know, the, 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 the six to 2% uh, decrease, depending on where you're at for the Greens, could end up being very beneficial. I think probably... Um, probably to the liberals. I know there's been studies come out that say some go to PPC, some go wherever. Uh, but I think probably general, if you're generally, if you're the liberals and you're looking at those ridings that the Green Party aren't running in, you're like, OK, well, we might put extra resources in there and, and get those get those votes out. So it's weird, though, that nothing's working because of the People's Party. Nothing's working the way it's supposed to. So the conservatives fall 
and the liberals don't rise. And then the NDP fall and the liberals don't rise, right? Because it's going people's party. Well, and they're moving they're, around and people are going to them for different reasons. So you've got, you've got kind of the, 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 you know, the outsiders, the block, the NDP kind of, um, I, you know, the anti-establishment people, but you've also got conservatives. And this is what I mean when I've, I've been saying that it's not just a, a segment of, of people that are, that are angry. You have, you know, John Ibbotson wrote an article yesterday and the title of the article was, uh, um, Aaron O'Toole, the most liberal conservative uh, to run an election. And I had so many people uh, uh, message me going, what in the ever loving fuck is this? Um, I like, do, 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 does Aaron's That's good think- spin. What? That's good spin out of the conservative war room, right? Um, yeah, but the, like the, people were like, what the fuck <laughs> is this? And so Too good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know what? We don't do well. I'm going to repeat it again. We don't do cute, clever and witty. <laughs> Three things conservatives don't do well. We never have. We should never try. <sighs> oh, man, I oh. do hope that this is a little bit of caution for all of the NDP and Green supporters out there who long for proportional representation and think that proportional <laughs> representation would lead to better governance in the country. Because uh, look at what kind of parliament you'd end up with um, uh, in this in this circumstance. I've had this nerd corner argument online with people over the years. You make the stupid mistake of engaging in that, and you know you know my view on this, David. I like I really think the proportional representation encourages small parties. It beats up the brokerage parties and you end up with, you know, anybody who can get a cluster of votes together says, hey, I can get a few seats and then suddenly I can parlay that into a leverage. And I just, I think it's a terrible way to go. But what about the debate? If there's, anything, the debate? That the, if there's anything about the, if there's anything that the constitutional wars of the past told us, it's that actually when you get past the very top level, there's not as much consensus about Canada among Canadians as you might hope. And that, there's a lot of cleavages out there to fracture. And if you had proportional representation and I wanted to be in the cabinet, I wouldn't run for a liberal nomination. I'd go start the anti-bilingualism party, get my 7% of the vote, and negotiate my way into the government. Big time. I head back to Prince Edward County and start the United Empire Loyalist uh, Party. <laughs> There's still a lot of anti-American <laughs> sentiment out there. <clears throat> so I watched the, watch yeah. the, watch the debate, Scott. I watched the debate translated. And uh, I must say that they all sound quite similar, the leaders. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, the, the only one moment that there was possibly a moment was the I'm a Quebecer, you're a Quebecer. That seems to be the thing everybody's clipping. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I have no fucking idea how a francophone uh, in the 450 area code responds to that exchange. I'm inclined to think it's not the same as Pierre Elliott Trudeau's uh, uh, spirited defense of his uh, bicultural background in uh, 1980. Well, I just want to say, though, that, that, that the only reason they're clipping that is the, it was the only time there, there seemed to be a pulse on stage. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I agree with that, but let me, let me throw two thoughts. Because um, you're right. I mean, the fundamental takeaway for people listening is that us three Anglos don't know. And I heard immediately from people, including Tom Mulcaro, I was on TV with afterward, who said, uh, I'm telling you it plays differently in Quebec. In Quebec, people thought that it was histrionic and contrived. And, and, and it did feel like it was like as passionate as it was. It felt like it was a run where he's like, I've been waiting for Blanchette to go that one step too far so that I could unleash this on him. And I think, you know, and, and, and that's not to say it isn't sincere, but I think there was a debate card somewhere which says, I mean, Blanchette gives you the opening. You say, you know, let's go. Um, I just, I, I think you should take Mulcair seriously when he says something is contrived as well. <laughs> but I thought, <laughs> I just, but part of me thinks like, you know, it's also about Blanchette and that Blanchette, like he's not had a great campaign. He did not have a great TVA debate and now he's on the receiving end of a beating. And so even if people aren't going, oh, well, I'm going to stampede here in Quebec toward Trudeau, I just think that it's, it's another it's another moment where people are going to be listening to television coverage in Quebec for two days where Blanchette will look like he's not on the winning side of a hand. And I just, I wonder if that has a, an effect. So what are you looking for tonight? Go Jenny. 
I'm very curious to see to see how the five moderators do personally, the six <laughs> moderators. Um, 33. 33. Um, yeah. Cool uh, in the I, gang. It's cool in the gang. It's going to be <laughs> everybody up there. French horn. <laughs> Um, I think that it's it's going to be more uh, all in the same. I think that um, there's going to be added pressure on, especially Aaron and a bit on Singh. This is going to be their first uh, chance in their kind of uh, in their native tongue, uh, so so to speak. Um, uh, so I think that there's going to be I think I think there's going to be expectations that they perform at a different level than uh, than what they have in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, French debates um, and. Uh, yeah, the one thing I've heard from a lot of people is that uh, there is a huge disappointment among people that there is no justice in foreign affairs section within the English debate. There was last night they, they talked about uh, they talked about Afghanistan uh, and and ultimately, like we are a G7 country. So and Afghanistan was an issue. Uh, the evacuation from Afghanistan was and I, 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 I still stand by that. I don't feel it was an election issue, but it was an issue that led the news off for the first week of this campaign. Like if you remember, even the day the writ dropped. Uh, the dropping of the writ, the uh, uh, the issuing of the writ. Sorry for all you you const- you nerds out there. Um, uh, was was second to the a- evacuation in Afghanistan. And so I think that um, the, the debate commission, uh, in their um, not so infinite wisdom, uh, has made a mistake uh, on that. I think the foreign policy section, Jesus, it's probably important. Sure, I guess it's important. But man, it would be like, in terms of audience reaction, it would be like when the Rolling Stones say, and here's a song from our new album. Be yeah, but it's... But, massive. it's, but it's, it's important, is what you're saying. I think it's important. Yeah. Yeah. So, loyal listeners will know I've spent a lot of time here talking about how important safety is to our sponsor, CN. There's a reason for that. Safety at CN is the core value. That might sound like boilerplate, but when you run trains across Canada and the United States 24-7, carrying a significant chunk of the economy on your tracks, stuff gets real. CN's goal, simply put, is to reduce injuries and fatalities to zero. You can't get any more ambitious than that. Every meeting at every level of the company begins with a reflection on safety. Everyone is expected to follow the rules. There are a great many rules, and to remind fellow employees who don't, even if the fellow employee is the boss, or the boss's boss, all the way up the ladder. That happens, believe me. And of course, CN employees undergo relentless training. There are safety summits. CN spends vast amounts of money on safety technology, some of which I've described here in the past. Each sector of the railway, and there are several given rails intersection with trucking and marine shipping, has a set of life-critical rules. Those rules are attempts to learn from serious incidents in the past and ensure they're never repeated. They are paramount. CN even has experts who study the science of fatigue and apply it to scheduling and work practices. Because, you know, tired people can get careless. CN's vision is to become the safest railway in North America. That means protecting its employees, its cargoes, and the communities along its network. And just let me take this opportunity to say it once again. If you see a train approaching, stop and let it pass and stay away from the tracks. I guess you'd call that a life critical rule. Um, if Singh goes out there, if Singh goes out there and does what he did last night, I, I think it's the beginning of the end for them. I think he's got to have a different play now. I think that shtick has taken them absolutely as far as it's going to go. And O'Toole... O'Toole needs to start talking about the economy and get this thing back on the economy. That's the only ground on which he wins this election. That's the only territory. Everything else is defense for him. But there he can play offense and should be playing offense. Yeah, I, um, boy, I really agree. And we, hearkening back to where we started with the poll numbers and the People's Party, there's no reason in the world without Bernie on the stage that that Singh shouldn't be trying to think about harnessing those protest votes and saying, you know what, I could be the vehicle for those, right? And and looking more animated. And he's got no choice. I know they keep trying to portray him as the happy warrior, but he has no choice to become the unhappy warrior. He's got to go uh, at Trudeau's throat. He's got to make Trudeau the issue in this, and he's got to try to position himself as the beneficiary. And that's not easy, and that's not maybe the preferred strategy you'd have, but they've got a few options where they're at. I'm really going to be interested to see what posture Trudeau strikes. Like, from my perspective... You know, and you've raised this, David, and I'm sure we all agree about it. Like he's, 
this thing has started where people are like, I'm so pissed off you called this election. You didn't have an answer. It's all about you. And so he's got to show some humility. He can't apologize for having an election. Um, you know, he, he, but he's got to emerge by the end of the debate with people saying, all right, like I see that he gets it. And now I don't have to feel ashamed about giving him my vote. I don't feel like I'm rewarding him for bad behavior by giving him my vote. He's got to get that across. And that doesn't take you to where he's been in the French debates. Because the French debates, he's been animated and uh, really combative. And I think it will be natural for him to want to show that same level of energy. You get in that mindset. You get into that rhythm. I think we're going to see that from him. But I think the Canadians don't just want to see him throwing people around the room, even if it's effective. They want to see – they want that permission to, to, to vote for him in spite of – uh, their disaffection. And and, and, I, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how he tries to thread that needle. And O'Toole, like you say, David, like O'Toole, like he's he's got a, like the stakes couldn't be higher tonight because right now this trend line means that he's going to lose this election and he's got to do something that builds a brick wall in Ontario and stops uh, the liberal resurgence and puts it back to him. All right. Jenny, you got a curse today? Yeah, my curse is, is to uh, Annamie Paul and anyone that thinks she did well in the debate last night. Um, Scott, I know you tweeted something that she she can she was. I thought she looked appealing. Appealing and connecting. Oh, that's that's like getting the participation exactly. medal. Like like when you when when we were kid when I was a kid in track and field, you got a red ribbon if you were first, a blue ribbon if you were second, a white ribbon if you were third, and all us other fucking slow people, we got big green ribbons to say participation. You guys are at the end of the day losers. It's a so favorite trope of the right wing these days. Oh, a participation <laughs> medal. Yada yada yada. Okay, send your fucking fundraising letter, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that she was completely underwhelming, um, I, 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 it, you know, and, and in her first foray outside of the 416, uh, outside of the 416 uh, area code. I did like her Sam Sharp shoes uh, or whatever they are, the the the, the uh, Adidas shoes. Um, but that's or Sam Smith. But that that was that that I think was the best part of uh, the debate for enemy Paul. <laughs> OK, well, her campaign, if they. <laughs> I got a, a letter from the Green Party yesterday that said that their fundraising goal of $40,000 was within view. And if they made that $40,000, they would have nothing but good news to report to Annamy Paul. Connecting and appealing. And, <laughs> connecting and, and appealing. Connecting and lunch in a I, savage way. I thought she looked appealing, and I thought it was a cautionary tale for how they've uh, robbed themselves of the ability to have her do anything because she was also ineffective. But yeah. anyway, blah blah blah. My curse is this. My curse is to these uh, to the to the cast of moderators that will appear on stage tonight. Last night we were joking about Alain Bazzetti and the others appearing on stage, throwing people around. You know, like I would say to the moderators tonight, there's too many of you. It's ridiculous, and but we're stuck with it. So at least keep this in mind. There is a competition happening this evening, and it's not between you guys. When you have five people, <laughs> you cultivate you cultivate the instinct for people to say, oh, I've got to show that I've got the toughest, sharpest question. I've got to show that I'm the one who's ballsy enough to interrupt the leader and, and, and correct them. Don't. It's not a competition between you and your journalistic rival. It is between the candidates. So just, you know, try, try, please, God. There's five of you, but try to be the most invisible five people on the stage tonight. Here, here. Excellent. Couldn't agree more, uh, frankly, with both of those curses. And then I will add mine, which is to, I think, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, you have an extremely difficult task tonight. You need to look like the Prime Minister on the stage. You need to look like the person who's got the best most thought through plan, which you do. You need to look like the person who's best able to pull the country together, which you are. And you need to look like that with all, without at any point looking like you know that. Like you know that you are the best person for this. This Somehow you got to win this election without getting rewarded. And so that is the, that is the straight that needs to be navigated tonight and for the next 10 days. Win without getting rewarded. <laughs> So, thank you to everybody for listening, Cursed and Cursors. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and to CN Rail. Thank you to Ecos for their super interesting data today, and to Nick Taylor Vasey, wherever he may be, and Politico. 
Curse of Politics, back tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. See you then.